you, uh, Your Honors. Sam Braver and with me, uh, Mr. Delaney, uh, on behalf of the appellants. We're here, Your Honor, appealing the denial of our motion to amend a decision of a bench trial of Judge Williams to conform to the evidence in that the judge found that the signature of my client, Mr. Gene Graham, and there are two Grahams. One was Peter Graham, the lawyer for the appellees. They found that his signature on, with respect to a document that they were trying to bring in the fifth complaint that they had filed for purposes of an easement, that it was not authentic. It wasn't his signature. That was the court's holding. We moved to have also amend her ruling that having found that, to say that in this case, Mrs. Schnur was responsible and that we should be entitled to fees well under the inequitable conduct doctrine. And just for clarification, the request for fees, it was not pled in either, in any of the answer brief, when I say answer brief, any of the case below. Is that correct? It wasn't pled. However, in the motion to amend our answer and counterclaim, when they brought in the fifth complaint that they filed, four amendments in the original complaint, when they brought an action on behalf of Mrs. Schnur seeking to enforce a forged document, that's when we amended our answer and counterclaim to assert, in this case, the defense of inequitable conduct, bad faith. And then with respect to that, we moved for, and that was not objected to, that leave was granted. And then our theory on that is under the inherent power of the court. And there's a, so it was not a statutory or contract. Then having found that, if the court finds that, then we moved, and they did have notice of the issue of enforced, that this endorsement was being, or signature was being contested, and I'll address that. But Your Honor is correct under that. Let me, for just clarification for facts. Yes, sir. I guess it would have been the fourth amendment, the complaint that we actually go to trial on. Yes. The fourth amendment complaint. Had multiple counts, as I understand. What had happened? Even some had started off earlier that had been dropped along the way. Yes. It's, we're told that in count one, that was resolved with the consent order. What count one was. Tell me what the nature of count one was. That's what I was about to do, Judge Dave. What count one was, that what, there is a, on this piece of property, this figure of square, on the western side of this square or rectangle was an express easement that had been granted by the common grantor of the property. The issue with respect to that one, and there never was any activity in the lower court with respect to it, injunction or anything else, was we have this easement, which wasn't contested, which was the access to their property, and their property was above the square or rectangle, was don't interfere with it. And our position was, and there wasn't any interference at the time we went to trial, we don't have any issue with that. We're just agreeing to do what we are obligated to do, and that's not. That was an express easement. Yes, never an issue. Never been challenged, had not either legally or practically, had been blocked off or anything. There wasn't an injunction sought. There wasn't a need for a declaration or anything. It was just saying, kind of prospectively saying don't interfere with it. Right, and there had been, there had been some disputes of whether something was parked there. But the time that we went to trial, that was a non-issue, and I did try the case below with Mr. Delaney. That was not an issue. So we agreed not to interfere. It wasn't an issue. Originally, then they had a prescriptive easement claim that was in the initial complaint, first amended complaint, second amended complaint, and the third amended complaint. And it was dropped when they finally acknowledged that they had permission. It wasn't against you. Well, they couldn't pursue it because it was permission. Both she, Mrs. Schnur was not there for the entire 20 years, so she needed to tack on. She acknowledged and admitted that despite having done this for three months, and excuse me, over 18 months of filing this claim, she was there with permission. And when she went to file the third amended complaint that had it in there, it dropped in the fourth one. 
when she was tacking on the years of her predecessor in title, that her predecessor had testified uh, well before the Third Amendment complaint. I was there for permission. So that went out. So what we have in the Fourth Amendment complaint, or the Fifth complaint, and so in, the fourth, in this last amendment, uh, we have an assertion that there is this easement on the easterly side, and that's the forged endorsement. So they did that, they filed that, with, and that, they wanted that to be reformed, and then specific performance, because there, there was an issue relative to the description of the property. And when, they, when Mrs. Schnur typed up the document, which I'll talk about in a second, and, and before I forget, let me save one minute for rebuttal. Okay. Uh, when Mrs. Schnur typed up the document and gave uh, at her husband's direction, and they worked as a team here, but I call them a principal and agent, but as a team, and handed it to him, which you'll hear part of my story on the forged endorsement and why there's only one conclusion that he's the only one that could have forged the signature. She had the wrong description. She had it another 100 feet to the east side on somebody else's property. So they wanted that reformed in their Fourth Amendment complaint. <laughs> and then uh, they added, it was the Third Amendment complaint that was in there. The Fourth Amendment complaint, they said, and, oh my, I forgot, I relied on this document. So all of a sudden, in the last two complaints, one were trying to enforce this document that never appeared before, almost two years into this litigation, that, oh, I've got this other easement. If these other two things don't work, prescriptive easement, and trying to enforce an easement down the center. That was, the, that was in the other complaints. They, and they knew they didn't have the two subscribing witnesses to the signature. It was totally unenforceable. So they said, how about this? Try this one on. And in fact, uh, we've got this one on the east side. And then six months later, on April 27th, I may be off by a day or two. April 27th is the last complaint. So no, oh, by the way, I relied on that. So we go to, when we show up, for trial in front of Judge Williams, all of their claims collapse. Uh, so we go to trial on our counterclaim to show that it was a forged signature and not an authentic signature. And that issue, that it's not an authentic signature of my client is not on, a, is not on appeal. That evidence is conclusive. They did not file a motion to amend or any post-trial relief. So what we have is an undisputed issue. That's not his signature. And what's important about that is that, and we'll talk about the forged endorsement because it leads me right there. The record is clear, and I can give you the record sites if you like. Mrs. Schnur types up this document at her husband's direction. Type it up. Well, now, no, you got to go back a step further. Though. Certainly. There was some type of document that Mr. Graham and Mr. Schnur attempted to record. Yeah, there was a, there was a, uh, and they went. And they said they wouldn't record it because of some problems. But they, but they then, but that, that. But that was the basis of her then typing up. She went back and then typed something that supposedly was going to be recorded. That was her story. That was her story. You don't agree, you, your, the, your testimony, what, what was your testimony as to how she came to type this thing up? She came to type it up realizing that uh, the um, document that, that were signatures were, that were, was not an appropriate document. That's why they wanted it reformed. There was no witnesses was to it. And the description Graham, was off. Mr. Graham deny going to the not, to record and all of that? Mr. Graham went not on the forged document. No, no, not the forged document. The document he went, before, did, he, did he acknowledge that he, he went to the went to There the was testimony that Mr. Graham tried to record it and it was, there was uh, and there was, but there was issues relative to uh, the description and when it came back when it came back they uh, they didn't have any of these doc the, the documents they didn't have the witnesses so Mr. Schnur Mr. Schnur tells his wife type this up which she testifies to she doesn't know anything about it or any of the other documents she delegated everything to him Basically, get me an easement, because what they wanted, and you'll see this at the record at page 503, they wanted this to be a commercial property. They were living in the back. They, there was some relationship. They wanted it to be commercial. That was the whole purpose of her work. The purpose of all of this was to get this commercial footage. They didn't like the Western easement, because that didn't help them. 
Okay? So Mr. Schnur goes with her, basically watches her while she does it. She then testifies, I'm relying on him, my husband, hands it to him. He then testifies, I took it and found Mr. Graham and I saw Mr. Graham sign it. Okay? Then whatever, then they, uh, they on their own had recorded at some point in time, unbeknownst to us. Mr. Graham testified months before the last complaint, that's not mine. So they knew uh, six, eight months before, that's not my signature. Okay? So now, what the court, and we did have a handwriting expert that said and, and that's, that there was no challenge as to the, either the number of witnesses or the timing of the signing of the witnesses? Well, he was also, I mean, on that document, mm -hmm. there were no, uh, the... Uh, I thought he said he took it back and had somebody in his office sign it a couple of days later. Well, he took it back and had Darlene Matteron sign it, one, one uh, witness, but she did not, and we contested that it wasn't an appropriate easement because there really weren't two witnesses who saw, allegedly saw Mr. Graham's That's what I'm saying. That was yeah. challenged though as well. Yes, it was. So she knew, there's two issues on that document. One is forced that they try to enforce it. And two, she knew that that document, like the other ones, didn't have subscribing witnesses. But what Mr. Schnur says, and this is the box that they're in, and why the court abused its discretion when they conc she concluded that there is no evidence as to who forced it, it is clear. He says, I saw Mr. Graham sign it. It was never out of his control. He controlled the execution of the document. He then says, I took it back after Mr. Graham signed it, and I went back to the office and Mr. Matteron, Ms. Matteron signed it. You can't get, you can't accept the fact that it's a forged document and not conclude that the only person who had control over it, the only person, it's the only reasonable inference and the record is clear on this, that he's the only one because it was in his control all the time. So what the court found, and we did have, and Mr. Graham said, was it mine? Handwriting expert said, it's not Mr. Graham's. Court, and you'll see it in what they wanted to attach, the reasoning says, it had some, well, I, there's some doubt, but she accepted the testimony that wasn't authentic. Judge Williams accepted, it's not authentic. And then she says, there's no evidence. You can't get there. There's, there's only one person, logically. Once you accept Mr. Uh, Mr. Schnur saying, I controlled it, and nobody else had the document. He's the only person who could have committed the forgery. But Mrs. Schnur was not with him. She wasn't with him. However, the record is replete, and they say, well, I use the term in my cross-examination cross deputizing. She, they worked together. She said, get it done. So he went out and got the signatures. And, what, and, he, and she said, I condone what he did. I authorize what he did, good or bad. I accept it. I, he was out there to get it done. I relied on him to get it done. I do deferred you, do to you think, him. Do you think Judge Williams, in listening to Mrs. Schnur's testimony, saying, I rely on my husband for all of that. I don't understand when you're questioning her specifically, well, how about this, how about that, and why do you need this document if this other document in place? Do you think then Judge Williams accepted her testimony by saying, I really don't know, I don't understand these things, that's why I have my husband do everything? I don't, I, I think that she might have reached that conclusion, but it would be an inappropriate one because Mrs. Schnur was a businesswoman, she had a commercial automobile business. She dealt with titles all the time. And you had testimony that her husband came in and said, oh, he wouldn't sign it, so I signed it for him. No, we didn't have any testimony. He never admitted that he... Well, that's my point. Well, my... How, how, just because she, uh, is the fact that they're married and that he was told to go get this, I need this done, automatically mean that she knew that it was forged? She put in... Uh, she, she gave I, him the opportunity. She, she gave. She gave him the input. She gave him the understanding. She needed it done. All of that. But did she know at the? T at what evidence is there that she knew at the time she filed this complaint with this document that it was forged? I can't. 
I, I think that on that, there's two, I have two responses. I mean, he's not the party here. He's not the party. That's correct. But he's okay. the agent of a party here. And he's a colleague of the party here. And he's a spouse of the party who was given the task. But so it's, it, the, the evidence gives us basis to draw an inference that she knew or should have known. Yes. And it's a reasonable inference, and I think it's the only reasonable inference, and, let me, and I'll explain why. And the reason for that is they had one task, get the signature. She went up, she sat there, typed it up, gave it to him, get it done. Okay, and he was the one who was dealing with it. She had him do it. The title was taken, the real estate was taken in her name. This woman is not a naive, uh, the traditional, historical, stay-at-home person. She wasn't, this was a very um, successful in her own business. She owned the car lot. He was, he worked with her. She says, so you can, when a principal, when, a, when a, somebody puts in place the task of getting something done, that principal is responsible, whether it's good or bad, as long as it's within the scope of the authority. And then the principal can also authorize, accept, and condone it, which she did. Okay. She said, I, so, I so take responsibility for that. the authority, we've got to have her giving him instructions, forge it if you have to. No, not at all. If she just says, go get it done, does that necessarily mean that she's saying, I don't care what you have to do, kill him, hold him down, put a gun to his head, forge it? Is that what that means, or is it just keep after him until you get a sign? What it means is, Your Honor, under the law of Florida, if you commission, and I don't mean that in the technical term, but you send somebody out to get something done and get it, and what is done is within the scope of the authority to get it done. If that agent, and, the law, and we've well, cited the case, there, there's, no doubt, there's no doubt that the principal is going to be bound by the results, and that's what happened. And, and even if it's unlawful, it's under the, the law of Florida. The, the deed is not going to be enforceable simply because she didn't, because it was, I mean, if it was forged. It's, you're not, she's going to be responsible for the, uh, or she's not going to get the benefit of the deed. But to go a step further and say that the principal automatically knows no. what led to that unenforceable deed, it just that, that I don't know that agency law goes that far. It's not the test. I, I think it does, and I, I, Your Honor, I would uh, suggest that the industrial. So every time, every time a a salesman makes a misrepresentation. The principal is bound by the misrepresentation, but is automatically a necessary, reasonable, legal inference that that principal commissioned that salesman to make that misrepresentation. You have to analyze the facts, because the law in Florida is, and we've cited the cases. Uh, it's the Industrial Insurance Company case, the Phillips Petroleum case, the Taco Bell case, and the other. That when you have a situation where you put somebody into in, in motion to get something done. And what is done is within the scope of that authority, within the task. And the person engages in unlawful activity, or in this case, inappropriate activity, in forge, forging. You can be responsible for the harm caused by the third person. Moreover, Your Honor, we also have here is that she, and you can, as a principal, you can do this. You can acknowledge, adopt, condone, ratify, and she did. I will live, good or bad, with what he did. Whatever he did, good or bad, and that's clear. There is no issue with respect to that. You can look at the record of 496, 497, and there are numerous in instances. So what we have is that there's a, that's the second step. The third step is trying to enforce it. Okay. I will keep, I'll talk about the inequitable conduct when I come back up. Good morning and thank you. May it please the court. Again, Marshall Reisman for Ms. Schnur. Uh, there's much to be said here. And uh, well, well, why, why shouldn't the ratification or the condoning of an of a, uh, agent's acts apply here? It shouldn't apply here. Well, there are a number of issues. I think there was reasonable doubt, although there may have been a preponderance of the evidence that was not contested. I think to take that extra leap to find bad faith on the basis of vicarious liability is, is an entirely other issue. But to, to answer the question as far as ratifying the acts of the agent, 
uh, assuming that we have this principal and agent theory here and, and assuming that Mr. Schnur acted as Mrs. Schnur's agent with regard to this real estate transaction and, as ev and, and assuming, and, and this is an assumption which I will contest, I do not concede, that uh, Mr. Schnur uh, improperly, uh, uh, improperly uh, signed this document and it wasn't signed by Mr. Gene Graham. Then the, the issue before this case, the, this court in this case, is whether there should be the imposition of, of sanctions under the inequitable con conduct doctrine. This is not contract liability. This is not tort liability. This isn't even 57105 liability. This is inequitable conduct liability that was raised, wasn't raised in the answer. It wasn't raised in the counterclaim. There was no request for attorney's fees in the counterclaim. There was no request for attorney's fees in uh, the affirmative defenses to the fourth amended complaint. So we're, we're, we're stretching that and, and for that reason I think I, I, there was not a single case fi uh, filed, uh, not a single case cited where there has been vicarious liability imposing bad faith on a principal. Imposing tort liability, perhaps. Imposing contract liability, perhaps. But bad faith liability in this extreme proceeding, the inequitable conduct doctrine, which is an extreme proceeding when there's no liability for fees as a prevailing party under a contract or statute. 57105 was never invoked to give Mrs. Schnur notice that they may have a claim for fees here. Only at the last minute after the case was settled, after the case was settled, in which count one, a judgment was entered in favor of Ms. Schnur, and I will take, I will take uh, exception to the characterization of the nature of the pleadings. Count one was for the unblocking of the West easement. That is the one count that was in all of the complaints. In the answer and affirmative defenses that was filed 10 weeks before this proceeding, in August, uh, beginning of August of 2012, uh, the defendant, continued to deny that count, continued to dispute that count. And, 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 throughout, uh, and throughout these proceedings, that count was disputed and resisted, although the focus of the litigation may have been elsewhere. Ms. Schnur was a prevailing party on count one, and they entered into an agreed order, consent judgment at the end there. So, uh, so to, and I hope I've answered the question as to why the, uh, uh, the, imposition of liability here on a principal, if the principal ratified, there's no evidence of ratification, there's no evidence of any knowledge on the part of Ms. Schnur, it's just because she said, the, the, the argument is that, well, I gave my husband a blank check to handle this deal, and I stand by my husband. Did Judge Williams, because we haven't seen any of the transcript yet, what were her, did she set forth her decision, her ruling as to why she was not gonna grant fees did she explain? Absolutely. And Absolutely. what was her reasoning? Well, the, the, the reasoning, w w number one, w w w Mr. Mr. Gr the reasoning, number one, uh, the most significant thing is that the defendant's expert was not particularly credible. The defendant's handwriting expert opined that this document was not signed by Gene Graham. He also opined that the, the particular document was also not signed by Ms. Darlene Mataram, who was the predecessor in interest. Ms. Mataram shows up at trial and says, no, that's my signature, I signed it. So as, and I, I cite this in my motion, and this is in the attachment at page 51, uh, where uh, Judge Williams said, the defendant's expert testified that Mr. Graham's signature was not authentic on the November 09 document. He also testified that Mrs. Mataram's signature was not authentic, and yet Ms. Mataram came before the court and testified that she signed the document at issue. That raised some doubt as to the testimony of the handwriting expert. In this particular case, Mr. Graham testified he did not sign the November 9 document, and the expert said that his signature was not authentic. And he, she went on to describe how there were various exemplars and, and so forth, and they may have been right, they may have been wrong, but there was doubt. And, and here, here we get into a different evidentiary standard. Was there a, uh, and, and the box that Judge Williams was in. Okay, we have an evidentiary standard of, of a preponderance of, an evi of, of evidence. Okay, Gene Graham says he didn't sign it. Charles Schmerz says he signed it. 
The handwriting expert says he didn't sign it. The handwriting expert wasn't particularly credible. So let's look at the testimony of Mr. Schnur and Mr. Graham. Well, Mr. Graham admitted lying twice. He admitted that he lied in, in, in the uh, document that is uh, exhibits, uh, Defendant's Exhibit 6. He also admitted he made a misleading statement in that document. Mr. Graham also reneged on the agreement to make an easement. There was clearly an agreement to make an easement, but it was, but it was reneged. Oh, no two uh, subscribing witnesses, easement is out. Uh, there was, uh, as, as Judge Williams went on to say, says the defendant, Mr. Graham, prepared and signed the October 10, 2009 letter, which he said he signed, and then he said Mr. Schnur signed for a 10-foot easement on the east side of Parcel C. That document is in the court file. It's in evidence. It's not alleged by anyone to be a forgery. There was an agreement here. There was an agreement for a long period of time that there be an easement, and that was to be uh, recorded. And, to, uh, and the judge went on to say, so the problem here is that somebody gave their word and didn't follow through with it. That's what caused thousands of dollars of attorney's fees, not the plaintiff filing a suit. The plaintiff filed the suit to obtain the easement that she had an agreement to get. She still doesn't have that easement. No legal easement was ever recorded, despite the fact that over $100,000 was spent on lawyer's fees. The court does not find bad faith in any way on the part of the plaintiff. There's no specific acts of bad, specific bad faith. There's no egregious contact. There's no delay. Now, and that was my question, and I think you just zeroed in on Judge Williams. So she basically made a factual finding that there was no bad faith by the party in this case, and therefore she declined to award attorney's fees. Exactly, Aaron. and that's, that's the standard here, that the Bitterman, the Bitterman case sets the standard that, thou, that this is an extreme remedy. It, it, no statute, no contract, no 57105 at the last minute, oh, inequitable conduct. And in order to uh, and then the uh, Smallwood case goes on to uh, say how it is to be implemented, that there has to be very specific findings, that there, if I may, very quickly, I'm sorry. Smallwood case says that there has, must be an express finding of fa bad faith, there must be detailed factual findings of bad faith, describe, and the court must describe the specific acts of bad faith, and, that sh and to show specifically how that conduct results in the unnecessary incurrence of attorney's fees. Uh, and, uh, and so this is a very narrow, narrow, narrow remedy for a very, very extreme circumstance. Now, in weighing this totality of the circumstances, as I've described to your honor, the uh, court looks at not only the testimony of Mr. Schnur, the testimony of Mr. Schnur, but also the testimony of the handwriting expert, who was of dubious credibility. Also the testimony of Mr. Gene Graham, who may have been of dubious credibility. So what is the judge to do? On a hearing just of fees that was filed eight days before this, eight days before this, a, a, a year and a half of litigation, I would I would uh, suggest that this uh, uh, litigation was not nearly as pr protracted and vexatious as, uh, as uh, has been portrayed. But eight days before the hearing, without any raising of this issue in the pleadings, without any raising of a request for fees in the counterclaim or, or the answer, uh, c come forward. And, and so Judge Williams is faced with a decision, okay, do I call the handwriting expert incompetent and a liar? Okay. Do I call Gene Graham and, uh, a liar? Okay. Do I call Charles Schnur a liar? No, I'm not going to do any of that. Uh, perhaps that, uh, perhaps uh, we have an insufficient record, but certainly Louis Star Schnur was not the, the perpetrator of bad faith here in any, in any respect. That's, that's the box that, that, that uh, Judge Williams found herself in, and it wasn't necessary to cast those kinds of dispersions and to really, how should we say, uh, attack the, the, the dignity of the folks before her which w was what would have been required under uh, appellant's uh, analysis. She did, uh, Judge Williams was faced with a difficult decision and did the right thing here. Now, I would also, if, if, your, uh, if your honors would uh, like me to uh, discuss whether this was truly vexatious litigation and the timelines that were involved here, I'm, I'm happy to uh, be caught, uh, go into that because in the alternative, it's been uh, suggested that even if 
the, uh, the uh, document that allegedly has an inauthentic signature isn't grounds for reversal here. This was a dragged out vexatious litigation with five complaints and multiple counts and so forth. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first complaint was filed uh, October 1st, 2010. There was no motion to dismiss, no answer filed. Se amended complaint filed October 27, 2010. Again, no motion to dismiss, no answer filed. The second amended complaint, that's when things started really happening, was filed on December 13, 2010. A motion to dismiss was filed on December 22nd, 2010, but the case was abated by stipulation from January 27, 2011 to uh, on or about April 27, 2011. There were uh, whether settlement negotiation, and I think there may have been a notice of a, a tax deed sale. So nothing happened in that time. Uh, motion to dismiss was granted in May 18 of 11. Answer was, well, it was denied rather, and uh, answer was filed on June 7 of 11. Third amended complaint was filed on, on October 4th of 11, and that and barely a year before these proceedings. There was mediation on, on November 15th of 11. Uh, no answer was filed. There was a motion to dismiss that was never ruled upon. The fourth amended complaint, which uh, is the one uh, complained of here, was, was filed on April 27th, 2012. Uh, answer was filed May 10, 2012. It was, the answer was amended, and the counterclaim was filed on August 1, 2012. Uh, the settlement was reached on or about October 8, 2012, and then we had the hearing on attorney's fees on October 16, 2012. So that is hardly, considering the length of time, as, as, as Judge Williams puts it, the, uh, you can hardly get a routine foreclosure through that quick these days. So to, to contend that this was vexatious, dragged out litigation is, is should not be uh, well taken in any way whatsoever. And I would, I would leave this court with uh, 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 the statement from the Kanakra's case about abuse of discretion that, uh, that, uh, uh, that the lower court, when there is an abuse of discretion standard, uh, this court is being asked to find that no reasonable judge, no reasonable person could find the way that Judge Williams did in this case. And I would suggest that there was substantial competent evidence to support Judge Williams' ruling. Number one, the handwriting expert was flat out wrong about Darlene Matterham. And, and that, uh, that raised a red flag as to the credibility regarding uh, his opinion regarding Mr. Graham. Uh, also, that uh, Mr. Graham had uh, testified uh, that he that one of the exhibits, one of the letters he had sent to the Schnurs, uh, contained a, a lie, and that was the that was the word he used. Now, in that context, also in the can, 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 I'm probably mispronouncing the name Kanakra's case, the court describes that the uh, trial judge is in the best position to evaluate the demeanor of the witnesses. Uh, their uh, their credibility, their biases, and so forth. And in that regard, I would suggest that Judge Williams did not abuse her discretion in this case, but did the right thing. Thank you. Judge Williams did abuse her discretion. She was in the position to judge, uh, judge the credibility. She didn't accept Mr. Schnur's testimony that he saw he sign it. She accepted, although she had some uh, she had some questions. The handwriting expert's testimony, it wasn't his, and she accepted Mr. Graham. So the issue of credibility is not before this court. We have a forged document that they tried to enforce. If you go uh, with respect to her, if we're going to measure inequitable conduct and bad faith by length as opposed to substance, we're setting a bad principle. The issue is here is that she enforced and adopted and accepted and condoned and forged endorsement. She said, what it good or bad? Secondly, she engages in the conduct of pursuing prescriptive easements when she knew she was there for permission, she knew her predecessor was there for permission, and she kept it on. Secondly, she's presumed to know the law. She, had, she read the complaints. She put in, tried to enforce documents that there was no subscribing signatures for Mr. Schnur. The documents were inappropriate on the face. Lastly, she comes up with a document that her, she has, she types up, she gives it to her husband. It's the forged endorsement. It's a document that all of a sudden, that she alleges six months later, I relied on this. This was what I relied on. In cross-examination in front of the court that was uh, uh, judging the credibility, I didn't rely, I didn't even know what this was. So you've got to measure the significance of her inequitable conduct. This is not about Mr. Graham's inequitable conduct. And they didn't object 
uh, to the filing of the counterclaim. So when we measure what's inappropriate and what's vexatious and what's in the aggregate, when you balance them together, she accepts the bad, bad act of her husband, which the court found. I don't believe you, Mrs. Schnur, Mr. Schnur. I do believe you, Mr. Graham. I do believe you, Mr. Handwriting Expert, because it's not authentic. And that's where she disconnects from the rest of the facts and, her, and the decision isn't supported by the evidence because you can't say there isn't any evidence of who forged it. He's the only one who could because he controlled it. He took it. She didn't believe it. You use your time. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, I got with my client. I gave both attorneys a download of what our people know. 